Good afternoon. It is really hard to follow that, um, but it's great to be here. It is great to share a little bit about something that I am quite passionate about and a really serious topic, uh, looking at Egypt and King Tut. So to get really into the seriousness of the topic today, I thought we'd start with... was a young man, he never thought he'd see King people Tut. stand in line to see the boy King, King Tut. How'd you get so funky? funky Tut. Did you do the monkey? Born in Arizona, who did the Babylonian King Tut? Give the seventh floor players a really big round of applause for on very short notice. Um, these are all of, all of my deck mates or uh, roommates uh, up on the seventh floor, and I really appreciate them. Um, so with that little bit of levity, uh, just a small bit about my background. I have a PhD in ancient Near Eastern history and language from the University of Bristol in the UK. I did my postdoctoral training at Cambridge uh, in the UK as well uh, with a specialist in Egyptology and Hebrew Bible. Um, with that, I went to Hartwick College, which is in upstate New York, uh, where I taught ancient Near Eastern history uh, and Egyptian history, and I would teach students uh, in the fall about ancient Egypt, and then we would spend January or J term touring Egypt. So I've been to Egypt many times. Uh, sadly, you won't, uh, but we hope to again soon. Uh, so with that, I really want to spend some time unpacking a story, uh, a story about untold riches, uh, and a story about a discovery that is the highlight of archaeology for pretty much the history of the world. And it's a story about three relatively unknown individuals, um, frankly a bit unremarkable uh, when we look at Har Howard Carter, who's here in the middle, Lord Carnarvon, who's here on the right. That's kind of an interesting little ball. We'll have to play with that. Uh, and then over to, to the left, uh, King Tut, who by his own right is a nobody from an Egyptian history perspective. And yet, when you put the three of these folks together, they create something really spectacular. So if we start with Howard Carter, he was British-born, moves to Egypt in his teens, and as young as 17 years old, he joins the British archaeological expedition as a graphic artist, uh, as somebody who is going uh, from spot to spot, supporting the archaeological teams and creating drawings. And from 1893 until 1899, he is primarily assigned to the Temple of Hatshepsut, uh, something we're going to talk about in a few days. But here in the middle is the Temple of Hatshepsut, uh, and she was one of the most remarkable pharaohs in the history of Egypt, and she has this spectacular funerary temple. And so he spends several years with the archaeological team there recording many of the images that are found on the temple walls. However, there is this, in 1898, a freak storm. A tremendous amount of rain falls in an area that's not supposed to get rain. And what they find is, as you go over to Ramses III's temple, the rain showers are coming through the walls and are damaging some of the pictures on the side of the walls at Medinet Habu, Ramses III's temple. And so he's asked to go over and spend a few months recording some of those damaged images so they won't be lost for all time. Now, you're asking, why would I tell you this? And it's because he has this encounter on the way home. He's living... Well, let's just look at the, where we are just in the Egyptian map. 
if this is the map of Egypt, and here in the Red Sea is where we're going to be traversing in a few days up through the strait, um, Thebes and Luxor is down here on the east side of the bend of the Nile River. If we look at the Valley of the Kings, Daryl Medina, uh, where Hatshepsut is, where Ramses III's temple are, they're just on the west side of the Nile River across from Thebes or Luxor. And why it's on the west side is living things are where the sun comes up because the Egyptians are... Uh, Sorry, I, I need, need to put a clock up here just so that I don't lose time. Uh, Egyptians are cyclical and balanced in everything they think about. So one of the primary gods of Egypt is Ra. And Ra is the god that comes up and is born in the morning on the east. He traverses the sky during the day, and then he goes down in the west and dies and is reincarnated ov overnight this nice cyclical pattern. So on the east side of the river is where people live, and on the west side of the river is where pe people die. All right, so he, he's over here working. He's been up here at Der el Bahri, which is Hatshepsut's funerary temple. He's asked to spend a few weeks down here at Medinet Habu, which is Ramses III mortuary temple, and he hops on his horse at the end of the day. And he goes trotting off towards home, which is right over here, so he can stay close to Hatshepsut's temple. And as he crosses here, his horse sees something and gets spooked, throws him off. And as he is pushing on the ground to get up, he notices a stairway. A stairway. And it looks like it's the first step on something that is perhaps going deeper that hasn't been discovered. And as an artist who has been working alongside archaeologists for the last several years, learning from them, gaining language, he thinks to himself, I have found something that no one else has. Now I can break away from being an artist to being an archaeologist. So he goes and sees Theodore Davis. Now, Davis is the premier archaeologist and financier doing work in this entire southern Thebes area. And he goes to him and he describes what he's found and he asks if Davis will support him in this archaeological adventure. Davis talks to him for several months, finally after a year says, yes, I'll back you on this and you can dig in this area around uh, where Hatshepsut's temple is. After a year of digging and cataloging everything, he has finally followed the staircase down and he's now at the door to a temple, or a door to a tomb, sorry. And he goes to Davis and he says, I think I have found something that has never been opened before. I don't see any evidence of any tomb raiders who have been here before, and this might be that elusive tomb of somebody who has things inside. And Davis buys into this idea, and they invite everyone from Egypt Every one of the administrators is there for the opening. They don't do any test holes to look inside, but they have this doorway, and on the back side of this doorway is riches beyond belief. And Davis has built it up so that his entire reputation is on this idea that Carter has finally found something. They open it up, and they find absolutely nothing. Davis is livid. He has put his entire reputation on Carter and the idea that Carter is going to be able to find it. And when they open it, they find this beautiful tomb inside. It's a tomb of a noble, has lots of great inscriptions, but that's not what Davis is about. Davis is a treasure hunter. Davis is a glory seeker. All he wants is his name in the papers for finding cool stuff and stuff of value. And he fires Carter and says, you're worthless. 
So Carter moves on. He's been a great artist. And in fact, the, what Davis tells him is, go back to being an artist because that's all you'll ever be. And Carter wants in his heart to be an archaeologist. So over the course of the next couple years, as we look at Carter, he moves into the government. He is over uh, at the Antiquities Contract Division for a couple of years, and he is involved in the Valley of the Kings for finding Hatshepsut's tomb. But that's really about it. He's going nowhere with his career. So we have this guy who wants to be something, but every time he's tried, he's put himself on a limb. He's come up empty. The second player we have is Lord Carnarvon. And this is a British noble. He's the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, and his name is George Edward Stanhope Molyneux Herbert. By himself, he's not a nobody, but he's not a somebody either. What he's primarily been known for up to this point is he was born into a really cool castle that you've seen before. He was styled Porchester, was, was his, his birth uh, title, and then he becomes the fourth or, or the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. His father um, ma uh, married Lady Evelyn Stanhope of the Stanhope family. That's very cool. But what did he inherit? Five really beautiful houses and a pile of debt and no income. So here we have, at the turn of the century, a time when the British aristocracy uh, is in debt and facing, really, annihilation. He marries Lady Almina. Now, what is Lady Almina known for? Well, first, you can find out. This is the ad section of our, of our discussion. You saw these books as we came out of London all over. Uh, looking at the real Downton Abbey. And by the way, our story is a story from the real Downton Abbey. And you have an opportunity to be in a book club for the real Downton Abbey and Lady Almina. Um, so this Sunday is starting a book club, and much of what's in this book actually plays into the lecture today. So if you're not doing the book club, consider getting one of these books, which are all over, and doing the book club. All right, back on task. So he marries Lady Almina in 1895. Um, why is that significant? Well, he's on the brink of bankruptcy, about having to sell all of these huge mansions when he meets her and finds that she is the illegitimate heir to the Rothschild fortune. So while her name is not Rothschild, her mother is not Rothschild, her father is Rothschild, and when they get married, he gets a gift for taking this Ill illegitimate daughter off the Rothschild family problem, and he gives them 500,000 pounds, which you might say is not very much money, but in today's standard, that's $50 million that the father gives him upon marriage, and he pays off all of the Carnarvon family debt. So not only, just to think, think, think about it, now you're not in any debt and you have $50 million. So they get married and Carnarvon is an early adopter. He is a guy that if there were iPhones, he was, got the first one. So he is out there, they invent cars. He doesn't just get a car, he gets a race car. They invent cameras. He gets one of the very first. So he is a guy who is very athletic, very outgoing, and has one of these newfangled race cars. Now, uh, the story goes that in the beginning, Carnarvon was a speedster, and he was pulled over because the policeman saw him racing down, down the road by the castle, and the policeman steps out and waves his arms, and he won't stop, and the policeman is so angry because he was going 25 miles an hour that he actually gives him a summons and makes him appear in court. He gets out of that, but he continues to be a speedster, and unfortunately in Germany in 1901, luck catches up to him, and he comes over a hill. And as he comes over the hill, there are two ox carts right in front of him. 
He tries to swerve off the road into a field, but the field has a rut and a stone wall. He flips the car and almost dies. So at that point, it changes his life because he goes from being this outgoing, athletic guy to a guy who now has to walk with a cane from the age of 35. Um, now, don't cry too much. He decided he needed exercise, so he did build a nine-hole golf course at Downton Abbey. But he goes, his doctor says, if you spend the winters in England, you're going to have ongoing health problems. You need to go to a drier climate. Now, most folks from England didn't go to Arizona back then. So in this case, he goes to Egypt. And Luxor has some of the driest, cleanest air in the world. You would know if you had ever been to Egypt, but you're not going there, um, as Himanshu says. So um, he goes to Egypt, and he begins to feel better. He comes back in 1902, and he establishes High Clare Stud because he's feeling so good. He can't ride horses anymore, but he can breed. So he decides to become a racehorse breeder. Uh, and that actually has gone well for almost 100 years uh, in that in 1905, he's appointed one of the stewards of the Newbury Racecourse, and his family became the head trainers for Queen Elizabeth and continues to be one of her closest friends today. So as you look at the family and racehorses, this continued. But Carnarvon decides that he wants to spend winters in Egypt. He goes back. While he's there, he meets Davis. And Davis begins to take him around the Valley of the King and see all of these kind of treasure hunter things that, that they're doing. And Carnarvon is hooked. He's like, this is some of the coolest stuff I have ever seen. Uh, and they're looking specifically for two different tombs. They feel at this point that most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings have been found, but there are two left. One is Horemheb, who was a, a pharaoh of the late New Kingdom 18th dynasty, uh, and the other was this fabled King Tutankhamun, uh, where they have seen a couple of artifacts, but they've never been able to pinpoint where those artifacts came from, and if he might even be or might not be buried in the Valley of the Kings. So Carnarvon goes and says to the Egyptian government, I want to sponsor and do an archaeological dig. I'm feeling pretty good. If you'll just give me something, I'll hire 100 guys, and we'll spend the winter digging through and see what we can find. And the Egyptian government says, I'll take your money, and gives him this pile of dirt outside of Thebes and says, you know, we think underneath this pile might be something. So he hires 100 guys, spends three months digging through the pile to see what might be in there, kind of like a pony. And what does he find at the end of his three months? A cat. So he finds a mummified cat. And while you laugh and say, this is kind of silly, he goes, I found a mummified cat. <laughs> and if there's a mummified cat in here, there's got to be more. And so again, he's hooked. we then have a chance encounter that ultimately will change the world. Davis continues to make finds, and all Davis is concerned about, he'll find a tomb, and he won't care what's on the walls. He won't care the historical significance. He only cares what he artifacts he finds. So Davis has this dinner party where he has found a jar and he thinks in this jar might be something valuable. So he invites all of his friends, including Carter, including Carnarvon, and at this dinner party, he opens the jar only to find a whole bunch of mummification wrapping stuff. And he pushes it aside and says, send it to, to the Met. I don't care, and he moves on. But these two guys meet and they begin to discuss what they might do together. This is some footage 
of them actually digging in a picture of them. It's a very short clip, but it's, it's a little, little, little bit of footage of them digging. And they begin to dig uh, at Darrow Medina and look for more tombs of these nobles uh, that might have significance to history. And they have a little bit of success. They don't find anything that is uh, amazing that changes history, but they do begin to outline um, what it looks like to be an archaeologist and what it looks like to be an Egyptian in the New Kingdom. Now, they're wanting to dig at the Valley of the Kings, that's where all the cool stuff seems to be. Uh, and they're trying to get an in with the government to allow them to do it. But politically, Davis has been digging there so long that they can't get permission to dig. Well, about this time, Davis finds Horemheb's tomb. Nothing in it. Davis thinks he may find a hole that might have at one point contained Tutankhamun, but he's not really sure. And he decides that Tutankhamun probably doesn't even exist at the Valley of the Kings. And so he retires, and the Egyptian government gives Carter and Carnarvon permission to dig at the Valley of the Kings. So if we then look to the third person in, in our story, we have King Tut, or King Tutankhamun. And to understand King Tut, we really need to understand his father. And so, sorry, just checking time. Um, King Atanaten looks a little funny in these pictures. Uh, we're not quite sure whether he had a uh, bone disfiguration or whether this is some stylistic uh, of the era. But Akhenaten is a king in the 18th dynasty, which where most of the major kings are. And he has a religious experience. If you look at the Egyptians at the time, Aten was the god of the military primarily. He was kind of a lesser god. He was the sun disk god. We also had Horus and, and Osiris, big gods of the kings. Horus, the god of, of the king. Osiris, the god of the dead king. Uh, you had Ra, who was the sun god. You had uh, combinations of gods. You had Re Harakti, which was the combination of Ra and Horus. Um, you had, so Akhenaten, while looking at all this pantheon of gods that you had in Egypt, Akhenaten steps out and says, guys, I, I really think that Aten is the one true God. All the rest of the gods are just out there, but Aten's the real one. And Akhenaten orders that every worshiping place, every temple, that is not to Aten is closed. Every priest who is not to Aten is fired. So he shudders huge aspects. And if you look down here at Thebes, Thebes was Amun's primary place of worship. And there was a huge place at Karnak, which we won't visit this time, uh, but which is really cool. It is one of the largest, if not the largest, religious complex in the world. And he shudders it. He then goes up to Memphis, which is typically where kings would have their palaces, and Hierakalopolis, which is over by the airport uh, in Cairo, was the primary worship place for Ra, and he closes that. And he says that we as Egyptians need to have one place to worship and one place for the palace. And here at a place called El Amarna, he creates a new king's palace and a new place of worship. So how do you think that went over? Not well. In that if you want to have a stable, functioning government, you need to have good relationships with your nobles, your business class, you need to have good relationships with your military, and you need to have good relationships with your clergy. And he has upset most of the military and uh, all of the clergy. And he is not creating wealth for the nobles, so he's not well thought of. 
He does, however, have the most beautiful wife in the world. Uh, Nefertiti is a name many of you have heard of, and Akhenaten marries Nefertiti. Nefertiti stands for the beautiful one has come, and many think that she may have been the most beautiful person, except my wife, uh, in history. He does worship the Aten, the sun disk, uh, and you can see in most places that still record him, him worshiping. He also had three daughters, and he was a devoted father and husband to his daughters. And if you notice, I did not say son. So Nefertiti did not have a male heir. One of his other wives did, and they named him... Sorry? Tudunk Aten. Because we don't worship Amun, we worship, worship Aten. So his birth name is Tutank Aten, and sadly, when the king uh, dies, Tutank Aten is only nine years old, and not a son of Nefertiti, the royal wife or queen. So quickly, he marries his half sister, who is the daughter of Akhenaten and Nef Nefertiti. And here's a picture of the two of them. Um, his half-sister, and I have a hard time with this name, is Akhesepaten. We can all say that later together. Um, so they become married, and Nefertiti's father becomes the regent, helping Tudunk Aten rule. Very quickly, within three years, Tudunk Aten changes his name to Tutank Amun. He also changes his wife's name to Amun. And I, who was a general and a vizier, very quickly goes back and says, we need to close El Amarna, reopen Memphis, reopen Thebes, start our military again. And so as Tut begins to rule with I as his um, regent, very quickly King Tut becomes popular and the nation begins to thrive again. They reestablished the military. They restored funding to the religious complex. He changes his name to Tutank Amun. He began the process of restoring the pride back to Egypt. Sadly, he doesn't look so good today. But um, within 10 years, unfortunately, King Tut, or Tut Unk Amun, dies. Now, there's been a lot of speculation. When they first found his mummy, uh, he had a big hole in the back, which is sometimes common, sometimes not common in the embalming process. And rumors were that he was killed by someone. Uh, but when they did tissue samples, he actually died of malaria uh, and likely had a degenerative bone disease uh, that complicated giving him some kind of blood poisoning to have him die so young. Now, now that we know our three players, we have our two guys, Carnarvon and Carter, and they are given permission in 1914 to begin their, their exploration of the Valley of the Kings. They don't want to start the same way that Davis did and others before him because they were mainly tomb raiders trying to find stuff. And Carter wants his legacy to be a true archaeologist, someone who goes in and really understands what he's doing. So he draws a map of the entire Valley of the King. He makes quadrants all throughout and says, we're going to go quadrant by quadrant. We're going to clear all the rubble from all the other digging. We're going to create a valid map of what is here and we are going to find King Tut. But also in 1914, just a matter of weeks after they get started, World War I breaks out. Lord Carnarvon, for those who have watched Downton Abbey, does what? 
Say again. Volunteers. He volunteers. No, because remember, he had that car wreck, so he's, he's on a cane. But his wife, Lady Almina, says, we can't stay here. We have to go home. And we're going to turn Downton Abbey or High Clare Castle into a convalescent home and a military hospital for those who come back from war. So Lord Carnarvon goes back with his wife and to England, converting their place into a hospital. Carter is forced into service, sent to Cairo as a translator, and the dig is closed. So just after they've finally gotten what they want and they're able to get started from 1914 to 1918, they are closed for the war. 1919, the war ends. They clean off everything and they go back to work. And it looks not like this today, but back then this is how, how it looked uh, you have Ramses the sixth temple or uh, tomb is right here. Horemheb's temple is over here, and each one of these is another tomb that has been found prior. In fact, they have found at this point in the high 50s number of tombs. As they get started, they spend the winters of 1919. 20 and 21 painstakingly going from grid to grid to grid trying to find something and they find a few things but they don't find what they're after which is King Tut's tomb and Carnarvon comes back and says we have to stop first through this period you have spent almost 10 million dollars in US money uh, on this dig. Can't keep going at that, that rate. Two, my son's getting married and that's kind of expensive. Three, we've sold our other houses. We're now just down to High Clare Castle. Financials aren't that great and we need to just bring the purse strings in. You can finish the season, but we're done. Carter's not happy, but initially he says, I understand we will we'll make this work. I'll stop at the end of the season. But while he's wrapping up, if you remember that chance encounter that, that they had where um, they found this jar and they opened it up and there was nothing in it but wrappings and they sent it to the Met, Met calls. He says, you know, we've had this thing over here for almost a decade. Our guys finally went through it. And, you know, I, th I think we have the burial wrappings of King Tut. So it's not a canopic jar, which I've shown here, but it was a jar full of the wrappings that were used. Now, if you were embalmed in a place, then you were buried in that place. So Carter's going, we can't stop. A and he goes to England, and he meets with Lord Carnarvon, and he says, we have to give it at least one more season. And Carnarvon says, I just don't see how we can do it. And Carter says, in that case, I understand where you're at. Just write me a note that you're transferring the rights to dig to me, and I will offset the cost to do that. Now, Carnarvon looks at him, and they've become friends over the course of time, and Carnarvon says, dude, he probably didn't say dude. Uh, he says, you're going to go bankrupt, if you finance even one year, that's all the money you have. I'm not going to let you do that to, to yourself. I'll fund you one more year. And they sit down and they look at the map, and indeed there are several squares that they haven't gone through yet. So they go, which one is the one that as the tourist season starts, which is the one that we need to do first to get out of the way for tourists? And... I mean, yeah, I won't go back. But if you remember that Ramses the Sixth tomb, in front of Ramses the Sixth tombs, the guards had built their guard huts to guard the Valley of the Kings. And they went, you know, if we're going to do the least damage, uh, let's do it first. Let's move all of those guard huts in front of that, and let's do that square first. And within three weeks of when he starts that last season, 
he discovers another step. And he remembers the last time he found a step, he got everybody really excited, and it was the end of his career. So he spends the whole day digging step by step by step down to a doorway. And on that doorway are cartouches, which says this is a royal tomb. And it looks like it hasn't been touched. But he had that once before, but he's really excited. And he covers everything back up. He sends a telegram to Carnarvon. And it says, at last have made a wonderful discovery in the valley, a magnificent tomb with seals intact. Recovered the same for your arrival. Congratulations, H. Carter. So they're sitting at the doorway of what could be absolutely nothing, or an embalmed cat, or something. So going back, the other picture I had was backwards to this. This is Ramses the sixth tomb. And if you look at how it would be dug, where would you put all of the tailings as you're digging Ramses the sixth tomb? Well, you would dump them all right here. And then the guards, because this is the central biggest area of the Valley of the Kings, the guards put their guard hut on top of these tailings right here. But when they removed the guard hut and started digging, this is King Tut's tomb. So they were able to find it. And Carnarvon and his daughter arrive a little over two weeks later, and they uncover the uh, stairway to the tomb, and they find that it is, in fact, intact. They open the first doorway into a corridor that is blocked with other rubble, and it takes them a couple of days to work their way from the first doorway to the second. They come to, to the second doorway, and they make a small hole, and Carter, being the Egyptologist, stands there, and they give him a candle, and there's all of this gas escaping from inside because you've got 3,000, well, Five, you know, yeah, three thousand year old air inside, and in a news article they asked Carter what he saw, and he said, "At first, I could see nothing. The hot air escaping from the chamber, causing the camel candle flame to flicker, but presently my eyes grew accustomed to the light. Details of the room within emerge slowly from the mist: strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere, the glint." of gold. And he at that moment knew that they had found the first and only intact tomb in Egypt. So as he's looking, Lord Carnarvon's over there, what'd you find? You see anything? And Carter says later in an article, I couldn't say anything. Uh, and finally, Carnarvon asked, can you see anything again? And Carter replied, Yes, wonderful things. So they create a larger hole. They're not really supposed to go in, but they create a little lar larger hole, and Carter, Carter's, or, uh, Carnarvon and Carnarvon's daughter, Evelyn, squeeze through the hole, and these are actual photos of what they found. They've been col colorized for us today, but these are not reproductions. These are the actual photos uh, as a few days later as they began to put numbers down. But just imagine seeing King Tut's chair and a, ca or a bed uh, and chess, all either pure gold or covered in gold. Just, I mean, the, the whole idea of what they must have been feeling as they looked in and saw all of these different things, chariots of gold. Now, if you look at how they came in, so here are the steps where they came in. They then cleared to here, created a space where they could get in, and they see this antechamber of the, what we just saw pictures, 
and they notice when they look that here are two guards and an open space that looks like it's another doorway. They also notice that behind this bed, there looks to be another doorway. So this is what it looked like before they opened. And they sent a telegram to the Egyptian authorities because it had to be done right. They needed to have the authorities of antiquity of Egypt together. They needed to put um, other dignitaries together before you open up a royal tomb. So, of course, they wait a little over two weeks in order to go in and determine if or what a burial chamber might look like. How many of you buy that story? That's the official story. The real story is they're not waiting. And you see this? Isn't it odd that we have a bowl and a whole bunch of sticks at the bottom? They make a hole just large enough to crawl through and, in fact, go in the very next day. They go home that first night, and they're so excited that they get up in the middle of the night. They meet back at the tomb, and they create this small hole at the bottom in order to crawl through and see what's there. And so two and a half weeks before the Egyptians officially find out that there, in fact, is King Tut inside, they've already been in several times and then put that in front to make it look like maybe they hadn't. And then in the official history books, it says, there was a small hole that we could actually peek through to see if something might be there. Now, Carnarvon's turning into a bit of a business guy and he sells the rights to the story to one newspaper, not an Egyptian newspaper. So one paper, and he does it for about what in today's money is a million dollars. Uh, and he puts together this story, and it upsets all of the Egyptian newspapers because they don't have exclusive rights to write about this. Uh, and in doing so, they create rumors that he's going to strip the, the whole tomb dry and take it to England, the officials come in and shut down their archaeological work. Trip to the tomb of King Tut. Giza, Egypt, 1922. U.S. sailors on shore leave past the silent sphinx and pyramids on camel caravan to the recently discovered tomb of Tutankhamun. Here lies the pharaoh of another age. Here are first Americans to see the tomb of the boy ruler, guarded by young descendants of his ancient people. Howard Carter, Wright, discovered the treasure-laden tomb by unearthing these steps, found the remains and fabulous riches of young King Tutankhamun, pharaoh of Egypt, 40 centuries ago. So, we have the story getting out, everyone in the world becomes King Tut crazy to just kind of speed through, because we're short on time, uh, Carnarvon is working with Egypt, the, the officials to say, no, 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 we are not taking everything to Britain. We're going to leave it here. Um, and he goes to Cairo. He gets bit by a mosquito, develops malaria, and dies a couple of weeks later. Carter spends the next 10 years developing what we would consider to be modern Egyptian archaeology, where he painstakingly photographs, catalogs, and draws every item in the tomb before it comes out. And so he is the one who creates all of these things, which are now somewhere that you won't see in the museum in Cairo. But next time you're in Egypt, you'll be able to go, go to Cairo. They have a brand new museum that has all of the artifacts, well, not all, most of the artifacts uh, that were found in the tomb. The one, one interesting thing that they did is they negotiated to leave the sarcophagus and the 500-pound solid gold sarcophagus in the tomb for all time. So at least part of King Tut is in the tomb forever. And it looks like that today. 
All right, we'll leave it there for today. Uh, I think I am back tomorrow to continue this and talk more about the Valley of the Kings, how it was discovered, how it was created. But thank you all for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.